Well, good morning. My name is Jeff. I'm one of the elders here. And as Drew said, we are back into the book of John. So if you would, turn to John chapter 7. John chapter 7. We're going to begin at verse 1. And this really is a uh, rather uh, simple narrative, but it has some real deep truths that emerge that help us to make sense of reality, make sense of the world, make sense of who Jesus is, and make sense of us as a church. So let's begin verse 1. Chapter 7, book of John. After this, Jesus went about in Galilee. He would not go about in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. And so after this, this is just a phrase, indicates an indefinite amount of time. If we were to go back into John chapter 6, which we will do a few times today, uh, we would see that uh, the, the occasion for that narrative was the Passover, which occurs in the spring. We're going to see that now we're in the fall. And Jesus is going about Galilee. And, and so John doesn't include uh, maybe a lot of details about this Galilean ministry. But if you go to Matthew, Mark, or Luke, they actually include a lot of details about this almost full year that Jesus spent in Galilee. Now, why was he spending time in Galilee. Well, it says here he would not go to Judea. Why? Because the Jews were seeking to kill him. The Jews. Now, obviously there are Jews in Galilee, but these Jews are, is John's shorthand to talk about the leaders, the religious elite of the, um, uh, uh, the, the, the religion that of that time was so far off. That, that it was legalistic, it was apostate, and, and it was not even really anything that we would want to submit to. And so this uh, legalistic religion is, is the leaders, they were actually trying to kill Jesus. This was how deep their hatred was. And, and so these two areas, Galilee and Judea, I know uh, I've never been to the Middle East uh, maybe some of you have. If we haven't been there, maybe it doesn't make much sense. Uh, here's a map, and I, I realize the map's kind of small. Here's the, the key points we want to know, is that Galilee is up here in the north. Judea is down here in the south. And, and so these are both Jewish provinces for the most part, but they had different leaders. Herod, one of his sons, was in charge of the north. Uh, Pontius Pilate was in charge of the south, a Roman uh, prefect. And, and in between them is this non-Jewish Samaria. And, and, and so Jesus was up here in Galilee, ministering far away from the Jews who were centered in Jerusalem here uh, because they wanted to kill him. And, and these two provinces, even though they were both, for the most part, filled with Jews, they were very different because the northern kingdom actually had um, very significant pagan cities within it, including Tiberias, which was the, the ruling capital. Um, the, they also had slightly different accents such that the, the, the southern portion often called out the Galileans, and they, they actually looked down upon them, uh, particularly religiously, because they felt the Galileans did not... Uh, strictly obey the law but of course where was the temple the temple was in this southern province and economically Galilee was actually better off they had better fertile farmland as well as better fishing and so Jesus was up there in Galilee and it's about a hundred miles separation if you will if they were to go all the way down to Jerusalem and so now let's set the context verse 2 now the Jews feast of booths was at hand. And so this is one of those major uh, feasts. Uh, it is also called the Feast of Tabernacles. And, and so what this was, was a Thanksgiving feast in the fall, obviously for the harvest time, but it also had deeper spiritual meaning. Because if you were to go to Leviticus 24, you would see that the significance of it is the Israelites thinking back and thanking God for the blessings in the wilderness. In the wilderness, where they actually lived in tabernacles, or what we would call today tents, right? We have a lot of our men who are supposedly camping out. Here's the, the deep, dark secret. Some of them are in motel rooms. But you know what? When you're roughing it, you got to rough it. 
So, so the, this, what they would do for this week, they would actually construct these, these tabernacles, these booths, and, and they'd live in them. For us, we would pitch a tent. And, and so they could do it in their backyard. If they had a courtyard within their house, they would do it there. If it was a flat roof, they'd do it on the roof. Again, what are they, what are they doing? They're thanking God for the harvest, and they're remembering the blessing of God in the wilderness. And so what's interesting here is that there was the tabernacle which uh, God had the Israelites build in which God manifested his presence. He also later did it in the temple. And what we're going to see here now is Jesus, who is the full and complete manifestation of God. And so this sets the stage. And these two verses really are a transition for us uh, because uh, I'm going to read now verse 66 of chapter 6 just to remind us all of what had gone before. Remember, Jesus was teaching, and then this verse. After this, many of his disciples turned back, and they no longer walked with him. Many of his disciples, and what we learned is that these were false followers to begin with. This is evidence of unbelief. This is what unbelief looks like. They turned back and no longer uh, walked with him. And so that's the context. And now John says, okay, it's a bit, uh, a little time later. And, and so he sets for us the stage for verse 3. Verse 3, so his brothers, that is Jesus, his brothers said to him, leave here and go to Judea that your disciples also may see the works you are doing. And so, okay, so quite possibly the disciples, seeing that all these other, uh, or the brothers, seeing all these other disciples walk away, they said, okay, Jesus, here's your chance. Go to this feast. Go to where all of these people will be. Go to Jerusalem, the head of our religion, and show yourself. That way you can get that many more disciples. And in just in case you're wondering, Jesus did indeed have brothers. Obviously, uh, Mary's first child uh, via the, the Holy Spirit was, in fact, Jesus. Uh, but later, uh, Mary and Joseph had other uh, children, and he obviously had brothers. How do we know that? Well, it says here, also in Matthew 13, 55, uh, the writer actually calls them out for us. And so this is a context of people uh, talking about Jesus, and they say this, Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And are not his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? And so we know there are at least four brothers here. Now, this is not Judas who betrayed Jesus. This is uh, another Judas. And so uh, here we have the actual brothers uh, of our Lord and Savior Jesus. And so going back to verse 3, So his brother said to him, Leave here and go to Judea, that your disciples may also see the works you are doing. Remember, Galilee was uh, a remote place. They actually considered it kind of the, the country or the rural part of the Jewish area. And so what they were saying is go to where you can be seen. Go to Jerusalem. Go to where all of the people are doing. And which, I don't know, it sounds like good advice, right? Verse 4. Uh, so they're continuing on. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. Okay, ca Captain Obvious, got it. Uh, if you do these things, show yourself to the world. Again, they're, they're exhorting Jesus, telling Jesus, hey, here's a great opportunity. Go do this. Show yourself to the world. But then here comes the twist, verse 5. For not even his brothers believed in him. Oops. For not even his brothers believed in him. So what John is doing is he's explaining what we just saw in verses 3 and 4. His brothers, they did not believe in Jesus. You find that surprising? Right? Here's Jesus living his life, growing up. Obviously, he's the older brother, but these other brothers come along, and there were no doubt other siblings, but we at least know of four brothers. And they were up close. They were up close. They were within a family unit. They could see Jesus very up close. And yet, they did not believe. How can that be? 
Uh, obviously, uh, what John wants us to know is that these brothers are just like every other superficial disciple. Sure, they're impressed with the works. They, they acknowledge that Jesus could do works, but they did not understand his identity, nor were they willing to entrust themselves uh, to him. Now, I don't know if you find this encouraging. You might if you have a family member who is not a believer. And the difficulty that it, it indeed raises. And, and Jesus lived this out. He lived closely with his brothers. Obviously, his brothers even traveled with him. And yet, they did not believe him. In Matthew 10, Jesus put it this way. He said, brother will deliver brother over to death. And the father, his child, and the children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And so Jesus already calls this out. He says this, that you might even have members of your family who will hate you if they, in fact, do not believe in Jesus. So with this context of unbelief, I want us to go back and look at verses 3 and 4 again to what these brothers were telling Jesus. And so uh, beginning verse 3, so his brothers said to him, leave. And just so we're clear, that's an imperative. What they are doing is they're challenging Jesus. They're actually telling him, or if you will, commanding him to do something. Leave here and go. Again, another imperative. That your disciples may see the works that you are doing. For no one works in secret to be, uh, if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself. There's another imperative. Show yourself to the world. Notice what the brothers are doing. They're actually telling Jesus. They're telling Jesus what to do. And they're telling Jesus really who he is. They're, they're saying, show yourself. And, and there's also another interesting contrast that I want us to pick up on is this. Is that they're very focused on works and doing. And, and so to, to, to see what the brothers, their perspective, I want to go back to what we read in chapter 6 a while back. Chapter 6, verse 14 and 15, when the people saw the sign. Again, this is the works of Jesus, what Jesus is doing, that he had done. They said, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Obviously, they're impressed. Thumbs up, right? Verse 15. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force. Nope, that's not good. They don't get it, right? It's like, okay, here's a guy with power, awesome. Let's go and make him king. Why? Because we get to benefit from that. And, and, and so once again, the eyeball test, they're seeing what Jesus is doing. They're saying, man, that man has power. Let's go take him and make him king, and so Jesus obviously had to withdraw from that. Why? You can't make Jesus do what you want him to do. The people were completely powerless to make Jesus do anything that they wanted him to do. And that really sets a good context because I want to reread verse 66 again. John 6, 66. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer uh, walked with him. But then notice verse 67, Jesus said to the twelve, do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter had answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. You have the words of eternal life. You notice the people and the brothers are focused on the works of Jesus. What about the twelve? They're focused on the words of Jesus. Because in the words of Jesus, he is telling them, who he is, and what he wants them to do. In verse 69, And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Verse 70, Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you? Did I not choose you? Okay, then I'll explain some things. Here the 12 is saying, you know what? We're hearing your words. We believe it. And Jesus is saying, you're right, because I chose you. And yet, one of you is a devil, and obviously he's referring to the one who would betray him. And, and so what we've seen throughout Scripture and what we went through last week, of course, is Romans 10, 17. Is, so faith comes from hearing. 
and hearing through the word of Christ. And so when we hear what? The words of Christ. When we hear the word, when we hear the gospel, then faith comes. Now, the world looks at this and says, man alive, if you guys are going to overtake the world, this is a very weak and foolish plan. Think about that. Our plan is to simply this, proclaim the gospel, the words of Christ. Why? Why is that our plan? Because that's God's plan. That is what God told us to do. And the world looks at us and says, that's weak and that's foolish. But this is God's plan, that the word of Christ would go out, the gospel would go out, and faith would follow. The world is impressed by works. The world is impressed by power and demonstration of it. But here we hear that the words of Jesus are key. And so going on to verse 6. So this was the, the brothers telling Jesus who he was and what they wanted him to do. And Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come, but your time is always here. Interesting. That, that now what we're learning is that Jesus, despite the pressure of people telling him, this is what you need to do, he simply says, my time has not yet come. But you can do it. You can do whatever you want. You, you see, uh, from Jesus' perspective, if you're not on a divine commission, it doesn't matter how you spend your time. Your time is always good. Go do it. You want to talk about free will, you're, you're absolutely free to go sin in any form or fashion you want. But as for me, Jesus says, my time has not yet come. And, and so what exactly does that mean? If we go back again to cha chapter 6, verse 38, Jesus said this, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but to do the will of him who sent me. Fascinating. I know we've looked at the Trinity recently, but here the Father sending the Son, and then the Son in the incarnation, fully God, fully man. What does he say? He says this, I have not come to do my own will, but to do his will, completely submissive. Now, this is not a mystical experience, but I, I, I catch myself doing this, and this may help you. Uh, periodically, I just do this. I exhale, and I say this. Your will be done, not mine. Your will be done, not mine. Now, why would I say that? Well, obviously, it's how Jesus teaches us to pray. But there's just this inner drive in me that just kind of makes it all about me. I want to accomplish my plan. I want this for myself. I want to do this. I want to do this. I want to do that. And I just got to take a break and say, oh, yeah, it's not about me. It's about him. Not my will, but your will be done. And so Jesus was, in fact, the most dependent person who ever walked this earth. Why? Because he lived this out. Not my will, but the Father's will be done. And so in this situation, when the brothers were pressing in on Jesus and saying, go, go, show yourself, Jesus stops them. And he stops them just based on his understanding on the sovereignty of God. And he says this, it's not my time. It is not my time. And, and, and what he's talking about, just simply going to Jerusalem. It's not my time to go. And he stops them with the sovereignty of God. But Jesus often relied on the sovereignty of God. We also saw in chapter 6 uh, this. But I said to you that you have seen me and you do not believe. And so now Jesus is going to explain why people do not believe in him. All that the Father gives me will in fact come to me. And whoever comes to me... I will never cast out. As we learned last week, the Father chooses those that come close. And finally, verse 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. That's the key. And I will raise him up on the last day. And so when people were pushing in on Jesus, he relied on the sovereignty of God and said, it's not my time. And when people would not believe, he again relied on the sovereignty of God and said simply this, the Father has not drawn them. And so moving on, verse 7. Again, he's talking to the brothers and he says this, the world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify about it that its works are evil. And really fascinating that, that Jesus describes this, that the, the world cannot hate his brothers. You know why? Because the brothers are of the world. 
the world will not hate its own. And so the brothers here are being called out as being part of the world. And why does the world hate Jesus? Because he testifies what, that its works are evil. And, and we saw this earlier in John chapter 3, this description. And this is the judgment that light has come into the world. And people love the darkness rather than the light. Why? Because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked thing hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works be exposed. And, and so the world hates it. They hate it and react against it constantly. Why? Because no one who is sinful and evil likes to be called out. And Jesus, by his life and his teaching, was calling out the world and saying this, your works are evil. They were being exposed. And so if I could illustrate it, uh, I would do it this way. So we have the world and we know already that the world hates. And that's a strong word, I know, but this is what is happening. The world detests Jesus. And, and remember who Jesus is. This is the full and complete manifestation of God. And the world hates God, hates him. And why is that? Because Jesus is constantly testifying. He's telling the world. He's testifying what? That its works are evil. They are evil. Anything that the world does is evil. And so this is on repeat. And so when it comes to the brothers, Jesus says this. The world cannot hate you. It will not hate them. Cannot hate them. You know why? Because the world actually loves the brothers. Because his very own brothers were of the world. John 15, 19, Jesus says this, If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Here is Jesus. He's saying this. There's a group of people that the world loves, and it's its own. And there's a group of people that the world hates. What is that? That's the church. The world hates the church. Why? Because Jesus chose them out of the world. If we go back to that diagram. And so Jesus himself, he chose. He chose the church. And so now what has happened? The world hates the church. It hates the church. Everyone else, they love, but they hate the church. The church, And I don't know if you've ever noticed as a believer and follower of Jesus Christ that you just feel like there's opposition everywhere. Opposition constantly. Notice the opposition that Jesus was facing. There's the Jews that wanted to kill him. And even those closest to him, his own kinship, his brothers did not believe in him. Constant opposition. Well, this explains reality. This is why the world is the way it is. The world is hates Jesus, and the world hates the church. And so we're going to constantly feel this pressure. Now, but here's the temptation I think the church experiences, and that is this. We tend to long for acceptance. Don't you want to be accepted? Don't, don't, don't you want to feel loved? Don't you want to long for a bit of unity with the world? Don't we, we, we want to be approved for who we are and what we believe, we long for this. Can I say this? It's never going to come from the world. It will never come from the world. The world will never completely accept us unless we totally compromise. We will never be unified with the world unless what? We totally compromise. We will never be approved by the world. Why? Because it hates us. Unless, of course, we totally compromise. And, and so this really does explain reality. We see it in the life of Jesus as he's moving around in the opposition that comes his way. We see it today in the midst of our church and the opposition we are facing. Jumping down to verse 8. 
So again, Jesus is talking to his brothers and he says this, you go up to the feast. I am not going up to this feast for my time has not yet come. And so Jesus turns the table, if you will. Remember, the brothers are trying to tell Jesus what to do and he says this, you go. He's telling them what to do. And he says this, I am not going up to the feast for my time has not yet come. In verse 9, after saying this, he remained in Galilee. And of course, what's that mean? Verse 10, but after this, his brothers had gone up to the feast and, and gone up in the sense of elevation. Jerusalem was, was higher than the surrounding area. Then, surprise, surprise, he also went up, in other words, to Jerusalem. But not publicly like his brothers wanted, but he went in private. Remember, this is very dangerous. The, the Jews were trying to kill Jesus. And so this is really an act of courage. And, and, and the, the kind of the bigger picture is this, that Jesus will not lay down for the pattern that human beings try to establish for him. In other words, he does not give in to our demands. If I could illustrate it, I would do it like this. Remember, his brothers, they're telling him what to do. They're telling him, hey, this is who you are. You need to go show yourself. And if you will, they're commanding him. They're commanding him to, to go do certain things. Go show yourself. Do these things so that all may see. But you know what Jesus does? He has none of it. He stops it right there. Because Jesus, you cannot tell Jesus who he is or what he is to do. Uh, the exact opposite. He tells us who he is. And he tells us what to do. Why? Because he's Lord and Savior. All power and authority has been given unto him. And, and so Jesus does indeed go to Jerusalem. He does indeed show himself. But notice what he does. One thing he does is he continues to expose the sin even the sin among the religious leaders, and it just provokes more hatred, more anger, and eventually they attempt to kill him. But second, Jesus also indeed reveals his glory, and how he does that, number one, is he obeys the Father. Quietly, he simply does this. Whatever the Father wants me to do, I do it. Whatever the Father wants me to teach, I teach it. This is manifesting the glory of God. Second, there's also a small group, the 12 obviously, but a few others that Jesus is teaching. He's actually revealing his glory to them in these, in these intimate moments. He's teaching them and revealing himself. And obviously, uh, the big way that Jesus manifests his own glory is through his death. No one takes his life he laid it down on his own initiative. Why? To, to appease our God and Father whose wrath was poured out on him. And so Jesus would not allow people to tell him what to do. Jesus would not let people tell him who he was. Can I tell you that that's the pressure we as a church is now under? The world wants to tell us who we are and the world wants to tell us what to do. How do I know that? Well, the world is constantly saying things like this. Why don't you just give in a little bit? Why don't you just make a compromise? Why don't you just say that particular sin is no longer a sin? And guess what's happened when we say, nope, we're going to draw a line and say, this is what God's word says. Does the world say, oh, yeah, okay, that's your prerogative? Or do they get mad and begin hurling insults at us? You know, they're actually not asking us questions. They're actually telling us, this is who you are. This is what we want you to do. And what we need to do is say, nope, we are resting on the word of God. Because we know from history, every time the church makes an exception, every time the church compromises, every time the world is never satisfied. They say, okay, good enough. Now change this. Now do this. Now do that. Jesus would not let the world mold him. We as a church will not let the world mold us. But it's the, the pressure and the opposition is always constant. That's why we indeed need to rest on the word of God. Verse 11, 
And so the Jews were looking for him. And again, remember, the Jews are the religious leaders. They're looking for him. Why? Uh, Because they want to kill him, of course. Verse 12, and there was much muttering about him among the people. And so now we're talking about the crowd. And so the crowd, we saw the Jews, now here is the crowd. Some of them said, he's a good man. All right, that's pretty good. And others said, nope, he's leading the people astray. Now, of course, that statement itself is is from the pit of hell. We know that Jesus was not leading people astray. As for he's a good man, hold on to that thought. Let's look at verse 13. Yet for fear of the Jews, no one spoke openly of him. The Jews and, and their desire to kill Jesus was so intense. The opposition was so intense. People started having to talk in whispers. They were afraid of someone else hearing. They were afraid of their own life. This was the level of opposition that Jesus and others were experiencing. And so, uh, if I could kind of summarize again where, where we've been. The, the world, if you will, even Jesus' brothers, they were looking at the works of Jesus. And even the people in Jerusalem, they said this, he's a good man. He's a good man. And who knows, others may have said, yeah, he's really moral. Boy, I tell you something, he's a man among boys, right? They could say he's a great leader. They could say many good things about Jesus. But you know what? All of these fall infinitely short of who Jesus actually is. And in fact, what they're doing is they're they're patronizing Jesus. They're patronizing him. Because they're pouring these accolades on him. Yep, he's a good man. Yep, he's compassionate. Yes, he's loving. Yet what are they doing? See, when you patronize a person, you may speak well of him, but it betrays that you really think you're far superior to the person you're talking to. And so every single person who, who, who pours these accolades on Jesus, they actually think they're superior to Jesus because what they're doing is they're looking at Jesus and saying, you know what, that particular characteristic of Jesus I like. Therefore, that is the Jesus I want. You cannot do that to Jesus. You cannot. And, and so the people were constantly doing that, and that was falling way short. But there was a group of 12, and, and those that were following, that what happened? They did the ear test. And that is this. They were listening to the words of Jesus, because in the words of Jesus, he was telling them who he was. Clearly. And he was telling them, hey, this is what I want you to do. That is why it's so important to listen to the words, not just see who Jesus is and what he's doing, but to listen to the words. And of course, we know that's included in the Bible itself now and the gospel. And and so this is really an important assessment for you to understand who Jesus is. It's the most important assessment you can ever make in your life. Will you listen to the words of Jesus and acknowledge who he says he is? Verse 14, at about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up to the temple and began teaching. There you go. Now Jesus, again, is using words. And so what I want to do is kind of wrap up because we're moving into chapter 7 and 8 and a very important uh, portion and tie it together with chapter 6, which we've gone through uh, actually starting back, believe it or not, in, in August. But we've already seen the crowd. Remember the crowd? The crowd said this, feed me. Back in chapter 6, we sure love you giving us food. They also tried to make him king themselves forcibly. They tried to make Jesus King. And we also see the brothers. And the brothers said this, uh, go show yourself. Go do this. Go do that. Not only the crowd and the brothers, but we also see the Jews. That's the religious leaders. And what were they trying to do to Jesus? They were trying to kill him. And finally, uh, we have really this assessment of the world from Jesus. And And Jesus says this, the world hates. And so all of this is, is an example of unbelief. This is what unbelief in Jesus looks like. And if you were to go back to August to, to this, this uh, 
we did a Sunday on what it is to be a false follower. Remember John 6, 66, the false followers who, who were following Jesus and then they turned around and no longer followed him? Here are some characteristics of these false followers. Number one, and it shows right here, they have a carnal motivation. A carnal motivation. Feed me. Oh, I like what you're doing. I'm going to make you king. Number two, they become demanding. You see that in the brothers. The brothers are actually telling Jesus, go, show yourself. Go do this. Go do that. Third, there is a contempt for truth. And the world hates the truth. That's why the world hates Jesus. Number four, they begin, they begin to become aggressive when, when they feel that conviction. And, and number five, they, they become grumblers and they, they, dis, they begin to depart and just walk away dissatisfied, disgruntled. This is the, the picture of unbelief that, that John presents to us. But of course, he does give us the positive, right? And the positive is this, is that there is a group, we see it, and what do they do? They listen to the words of Jesus. And they say this, I repent and believe. I repent and believe. That's what it is. I repent and believe. And so now, if you will, let's go to the rest of the story. So the brothers were of the world. The world loved them. Why? Because they were of the world. But what happened to the brothers? We're going to look at a verse in Acts chapter 1. And so to set the stage, Jesus now has died. He was buried. He resurrected from the dead. And he has ascended on high. And he had told his immediate group of followers to go and wait for him. Why? Because he was going to give the spirit and the church was going to be born. What about that group that was waiting for the birth of the church? All of these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. There they were. They were waiting. They were going to be part of the birth of the church. We see this again, 1 Corinthians 15. Paul is speaking and he says this, For I delivered to you as first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then verse 7, Then he appeared to James, who is the brother of Jesus, then to all the apostles. So indeed, the father drew Jesus' own brothers to him, and James became a leader in the Jerusalem church. We also have an epistle that he wrote, the very word within the very word of God, the rest of the story. And so John, obviously, uh, we, we've read this many times, but he concludes this gospel with this, John 20, 31. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. You know, we live in a world full of evil and hatred, but the Father chooses some so that we might believe. And yes, there is opposition, and the pressure is on us to conform to the world, but we have the promises of God, we have the power of God, and we've got the glory of God, because God's Holy Spirit resides where? Now, not in a tabernacle, not in a temple, but within our hearts, within the church. Praise God for his plan. It is flawless, brilliant, and perfect. Let's do this. The band's going to come up, and as they're coming up, I do want to pray, and maybe you pray with me, and, and, and all we're going to do is just say this, Lord, your will be done, not mine. Father God, again, glorious are you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your son. Thank you for this example. Thank you that Jesus never gave in to the world one bit. May we as a church follow you all the way. Your will be done not ours, as well as in our individual family and individual lives. Your will be done, not ours. To you be the glory. Amen.